Hello everyone, this is Paul from Ortho Eval Pal, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about ultrasound. But before I do that, I just want to give you a little background for those of you who are new at viewing some of our YouTube videos or listening to my podcast on uh, Ortho Eval Pal. I just want to give you a little background, who I am, what I do. Um, so I'm a physical therapist, have been for over 28 years now, and I actually did uh, some teaching for about five years on therapeutic modalities for athletic trainers. So I do have a little bit of background on the use of modalities. I've been using modalities ever since I graduated. Uh, probably using them a little bit less now than I used to, but um, I still use it. And I, an ultrasound is a tool um, that we use. And if we just depended on one modality alone, I think we would all be in trouble. So um, let me explain a little bit about what ultrasound is, how it works, and why we use it. So. Therapeutic ultrasound is different than diagnostic ultrasound. We're not going to find kidney stones and babies and things like that with this type of ultrasound. Um, the effect we're trying to do here is get a little increase in tissue temperature deep inside the body. So different than putting a hot pack on the skin and having the heat go through the skin, through the fat, into the muscle and into the tendons, those deep tissues, this actually sends a sound wave that's a little bit deeper to help heat those tissues that are deeper than you would get with a hot pack. So how does ultrasound work? Well, inside of this sound head right here is a man-made crystal. Um, I might be able to take this one off. And I say a man-made crystal. There it is. <clears throat> you can see in here, deep inside, there's, um, it's lead zirconate titanate. It's uh, basically three elements put together so that when electricity hits it, um, it expands and contracts really, really quickly. And when it does that, um, that expansion and contraction will cause a vibrational sound wave. And that sound wave will penetrate through the skin and into the tissue. So the way I explain this to patients is that when that sound wave goes through, it causes friction to the cells in the soft tissue, just like rubbing your hands together. So the harder and faster you rub your hands together, the hotter it gets. And that can increase that temperature of that tissue up to four degrees Celsius, four centimeters deep, if you use the right parameters. Now, um, so you can increase the tissue of that temperature. And by doing that, you increase blood flow to the area. Well, anytime you increase blood flow to the area, that can be helpful in bringing nutrition to that region and help the healing properties of that damaged tissue. Um, the, the other thing it can do is increase the elasticity of that tissue by warming it up a little bit. Now, one of the things that you need to remember is that when you ultrasound a tissue to help increase the tissue temperature, um, once you finish that ultrasound, within about three minutes or so, that tissue temperature will drop back to its normal, and then you lose that ability to make the tissue a little more extensible. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is location and how to use your ultrasound, but I also want to get a little more in depth about, you know, the types of ultrasounds that you have out there and sound head size and whatnot so that you can make your ultrasound treatment a little more effective. So if you take a look at these two ultrasounds, the sound heads are both two different sizes. Okay, so if you're going to be doing a really large area, let's say you're doing a quad or a periformis or even a lateral epicondyle, you're going to want a little bit larger sound head. If you're doing, let's say, a D core veins in this area or uh, just a one specific tendon, you're going to want to get into a ultrasound head that is a little bit smaller like this. Okay, so you can see the difference in the size of the sound head. So one of the things you need to remember is that a ultrasound has an ERA or an effective radiating area. That means that the sound wave does not come out through the whole sound head. It only comes out of about three quarters of that sound head. So strongest in the middle and then a little bit less on the outside. So if you would take a look at the sound wave, it makes kind of like a little bell curve like this when it comes out, but the edges don't produce a lot of sound waves. So when you think that the whole head is, that's touching the skin is sending sound wave, it's not. So that's why when you ultrasound an area, you should really not ultrasound an area any more than two times the size of the sound head 
okay? So let's say the area that we're doing is right in the center here. We want to do about two times that sound head. You don't want to be going all over the place because then you'll lose the effectiveness of that sound wave penetrating into one spot. So that effective radiating area though, if you keep it in one spot, number one, it will burn the patient. It'll be very, very uncomfortable because of a high concentrated sound wave in one area. Um, and then you don't get all of the sound wave coming out of the whole head. So you want to cover that area by doing little circles over the region. Okay, that's the effective radiating area. The other important thing about the mechanism of how an ultrasound works is the beam non-uniformity ratio or the BNR. And so when you look on a ultrasound head like this, now, it should tell you what that BNR is, or when you purchase an ultrasound, the higher the BNR, the better. So if you have a nine to one uh, BNR, that will make that sound a little more uniform over the area that where it comes out. It won't feel so spiky or sharp. Uh, some of the old, old ultrasounds have really low BNRs of two to one, three to one. Um, those can be quite uncomfortable. You can actually burn capillaries with some of these really old ultrasounds. So it's not a bad idea to update your ultrasound. Take a look at that BNR, make sure that number is really high so you can get the most effective treatment. So again, ultrasound alone is not a great treatment just to do on its own. But if you're gonna use it as a tool, make sure that you use it as efficiently and effectively as possible, okay? So it's very important that you understand the type of tissue that you're ultrasounding and the depth of the tissue that you're ultrasounding. So if you are doing a really deep tissue, let's say like a piriformis muscle um, or a gluteal muscle, you want to really want to heat that tissue nice and deep, you want to use one megahertz. That will penetrate a lot deeper. If you're doing something um, like a decorvanes or uh, the back of the hand, maybe a patella tendon, uh, the uh, triceps insertion, then you want to go with three megahertz because that will give you more of a surface ultrasound um, and that will not penetrate as far down because if you're close to the bone you'll get a little discomfort when you ultrasound that area <clears throat> now with that in mind so now you know the depth so using one megahertz for deep three for on the surface um, there are continuous and pulsed ultrasounds that you can do so if somebody comes in with an acute injury there's maybe a lot of inflammation a lot of swelling you probably want to use a pulsed ultrasound um, I typically use 50% pulsed if it's you know subacute acute um, just to help decrease that inflammation in that area when you're using pulsed ultrasound you want to go a little bit slower with your ultrasound um, motion so that you get that pulsating because if you do 50% pulse, that means you're gonna get 50% sound and then it stops. 50% sound and then it stops. So it's on and off, on and off. Whereas if you use continuous, that sound wave is continuous all the time. Um, so that continuous is more thermal. It's gonna help increase the temperature of the tissue. You don't wanna do that on somebody who has an acute inflammation or a, 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 you know, a fresh ankle sprain or something like that. Um, the other consideration is you know, what are you trying to achieve with your ultrasound? If you're trying to achieve, you know, elasticity of the tissue and increasing blood flow to the area, then maybe you want to consider stretching that tissue while you're doing the ultrasound. Because remember that the temperature of the tissue will decrease about three minutes after you're done the ultrasound. So if you're doing a plantar fasciitis, let's say underneath the bottom of the foot, I like to stretch the patient into dorsiflexion and extend those toes a little bit and stretch that fascia while I'm doing that ultrasound so that I can help increase the elasticity of that. Maybe I'm stretching the Achilles or I'm stretching the extensor mechanism. If I want to increase the mobility of that, um, I might stretch it as I ultrasound it so that I'm heating it, bringing blood flow to it and stretching all at the same time. So think about that when you're doing your treatment. Think about the depth of the tissue. Now, ultrasound cannot penetrate much more than four centimeters deep if you're doing one megahertz at two watts per centimeter squared. So if you think it's gonna penetrate really, really deep on uh, you know somebody who may be a little overweight or you're trying to get to a facet joint or something like that, are you really getting an effective treatment out of that? So remember the depth of the tissue and your parameters that you use when you're using ultrasound. Um, some of the other things you need to remember, patient comfort. So when you explain that it produces heat, deep heat, patients will oftentimes say, well, I don't feel anything, so I don't think this is really effective. Um, 
one thing you need to remember is that your sensory fibers are more on the surface. This sound wave is being produced deep inside the tissue. Okay, and you don't have sensory fibers deep inside your muscles and tendons and, and whatnot. So they're not going to feel that. They may feel a little warming effect later on as you're, you're getting into six, seven, maybe eight minutes of doing your ultrasound because the, the sound head is actually starting to warm up because all those sound waves are coming through. Obviously, that sound wave is going to move those molecules, warm them up, and cause a little friction to the surface of the ultrasound. So they may feel the ultrasound getting warmer. But... You should never adjust your ultrasound to what the patient feels in regards to the heat, okay? And that's something that people used to do in the past. Um, you don't do that. You do, you adjust your parameters to the tissue that you are working on. Explain that to your patient so they don't have this anticipation that they should feel a heating effect. If you're doing pulsed ultrasound, um, you're going to be going a little bit slower and they may not feel any heat at all. Um, when you are ultrasounding, the technique is important. You should not just keep your ultrasound in one spot if you're doing thermal ultrasound because that will really hurt the patient because you're going to concentrate that sound wave in one spot and just like you know um, a rope that's rubbing on your hand in one spot for a long time will cause a burning effect. Well, this will do the same thing. You won't physically burn the patient, but they will feel a sensation um, that is very, very uncomfortable. They're not going to like it. So it's important that you have this constant little circular motion going in that area, and you're not going any further than twice the size of the sound head to be most effective while you're doing that. If they can't stand the discomfort, you may want to turn it down a little bit. But you don't want to be going really fast in one circle because that will also be quite uncomfortable for the patient. So a mini circular motion is important. And if you're doing pulsed ultrasound, you can actually go a little slower just so that you can focus it on that area. Make sure you expose the area as well as you can that you're working on. So if you're doing a rotator cuff, let's say, uh, insertion, the deltoid's a pretty thick muscle. So you can expose that cuff a little bit by extending the shoulder some to work on that area. And that may make it a little bit more effective. So again, I try to make sure that the location is correct, that I'm not ultrasounding an area that is too large. I'm using the right frequency, so one megahertz versus three megahertz. I look at the depth of the tissue in order to uh, increase my wasp per centimeter squared. So if it's a little deeper tissue, you're gonna to wanna to go a little higher with that. If it's really surface and near the bone, they won't be able to tolerate that because that sound wave is gonna hit the bone and bounce back, cause a lot of discomfort there. Some people have utilized therapeutic ultrasound to identify you know, stress fractures or fractured areas like a metatarsal stress fracture um, because that sound wave, when you go slowly over the fracture site, causes a vibration and that vibration can cause some irritation to the fracture site. And if you are going over the area and then you hit the fracture site, they have a significant amount of pain or a deep ache, and then you continue on and it's not so bad, you rub back over it and it's painful again, you may want to suggest that they go to the emergency room or get an x-ray um, to uh, identify if there actually is a fracture. It's not um, a super dependable way of doing it, but if somebody comes in and they haven't had an x-ray, you could utilize that as a tool to try to identify if there is a fracture in that region. Um, what do you use for conducting gels? Uh, we, we just get an ultrasound, transmission gel, aqua gel uh, works fine. Lotions can work fine. Um, there are medicated gels that you can use out there. They call that phonophoresis when you try to drive medication through the skin into the tissue. And they found that to be um, uh, quite ineffective. So I have not done a phonophoresis treatment uh, in over 15 years. Uh, I'd rather do iontophoresis, which I find to be a little more effective. Um, like I said, uh, I do ultrasound with patients. I'm quite selective. I try to keep my uh, programs a little bit more functional. But uh, if you have a lot of tightness or a lot of muscle soreness, um, patients can find quite a bit of, uh, of comfort by doing therapeutic ultrasound. And I have actually added that one thing to a treatment program to find a pretty significant improvement in how they're doing sometimes. So um, I don't do it all the time, but I do uh, use it as a, an adjunctive piece of treatment when, I am, uh, when I'm working with patients. I'm trying to think if there's anything else we need to know about ultrasound. Um, 
you know, contraindications, you want to make sure you don't do it uh, transcerebrally, don't do it over the eyes, not over a, a belly of uh, somebody who is pregnant. You want to avoid doing it over um, a, a total joint replacement where there's cement uh, over the cemented area. You want to avoid that. You want to avoid doing it over an area of a pacemaker. Um, Try to avoid open wounds if possible. Um, but other than that, um, it's a pretty safe modality. And um, again, something that I use uh, quite often. Now, if you folks have any questions about ultrasound or you wanna make any comments about this video, please leave those in the comment section um, of the video today. If you like our video, give us a thumbs up. I know it was a little on the lengthy side, I apologize. Um, if you haven't already subscribed to OrthoEvalPal, please do so. Um, our subscriber base is increasing significantly all the time. Glad to say we just hit 5 million views and over 21,000 subscribers. We want to get that growing some more. I want to keep teaching like this. I really enjoy that. If you want to help Orthoe Valpal, hit the applaud button next to the thumbs up button and, uh, and, and help us out. Uh, again, folks, thank you so much for watching and for listening to Orthoe Valpal. I really appreciate it and I appreciate all the great comments you've been sending. Take care.